joy. That thing is a time to reflect and to anticipate our joy in the work of Jesus. But today we get a little glimpse of what that joy looks like. We tend to feel joy and hear good news. We have joy in the good news that Jesus cares for us and wants to have a relationship with us. So today we like the pink joy candle to serve as a sign of our great joy in our Savior, Jesus. You can leave it on too, it's fine. Yeah.
our Heavenly Father. We rejoice this morning in a God who loved us enough to create us in his image and act in his likeness. We thank you so much that he created love, that he created human relationships. We thank you that he demonstrated this relationship through giving himself to his son Jesus Christ over 2,000 years ago. Thank you, Lord. We thank you that when he died and rose again, that Jesus Christ went back to the Father and asked the Father to send us the Holy Spirit Amen. so that he could come and Amen. live with us forever. Right. And Father, we thank you this morning for human family times. We thank you for the new babies yes. that have been born in our congregation and in our community this past year. And now for this new little girl, Hannah Joan Ashley, born to Morgan and Carissa. We rejoice, Father, also for divine relationships. Those that are created through the bonds, not of blood, but the bonds of Jesus' blood, that brings us together as brothers and sisters, fathers and mothers, and friends because of Jesus. Amen. And we pray that this Christmas time you will be with those who are experiencing a loss. But this Christmas there will be a change. One will be missing around the family tree. Yes, Lord. We pray that you will comfort those people yes, and make yes, Jesus very real to them. Yes, Lord. And we pray for those who rejoice that new people around their table. Yes, that as they see this new life around the table, they will rejoice in Jesus' heart. We pray for those who are at this altar representing different people, their own need of praise or their own need for strength and help, whatever they're experiencing. Will you please meet with them? We pray for those who are sick. We pray you extend your hand to them this morning. We thank you, O oh God, most of all for spiritual healing, but we thank you also that you are the God of physical healing and using doctors and using medication, but beyond that, your own hand, you have brought healing to people. But we thank you, Lord, for ultimate healing, that when people are released from this body and go to be with Jesus, who have loved you, they have ultimate healing. Hallelujah. And now we pray, Father, that you will bless us in the remainder of this service. Bless those who are lonely at this time of year, those who have no family, who feel alone. Be with them, those who are lonely in this congregation. May we extend our hands of friendship to them and make them feel included in our family. And now, Father, we pray that you will bless Pastor Mike as he ministers this morning in the Word. And may our hearts be open to your truth. And I pray especially for Pastor Betty this morning. In that seat at the back, suffering from this uh, malady of a kidney stone. We pray in Jesus' name that we will cause this medication that has been given her to work. Yes. She may be alleviating the pain and suffering. Yes. Be able to enjoy Christmas with her family, her church, and her friends. Yes. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose strong name we pray. Amen. Amen.
and uh, we do wish to see you the remainder of the Christmas Advent season. But beyond that, at the presence of the Lord, we can truly uh, exemplify and live out in your lives and in your families. Thank you. Jordan, and thank you, God, for the perfect sermon in our capacity and this church. And now, at this time, we'll wait upon you for the Lord's tithe and our offering. Lord God, who gave the greatest gift of all. Son Jesus Christ. We pray now that as we give to you gifts to worship and honor you through material possessions, you will bless them and multiply them to spread your kingdom's news in this local area and around the world. In Jesus' name. Nothing out of the ordinary. 
Are you waiting that you are anticipating these great things to happen during this Christmas season as we get closer and closer to the day in which we celebrate God becoming flesh and living among us? And your expectations are so high of what's going to take place on that first Christmas in your life and maybe the 65th Christmas in your life now or whatever year you're out, you are and you feel that down again and again and again. Good movie, good food, and anticipate a good Christmas, and it all comes down to love, humbug, disappointment. Have you ever been disappointed about what you believed about someone or something after a new story came out to reveal what the person truly was? And you find out that person was not he, but he or she was advertised to be. And you feel let down. Disappointed, discouraged. As we shift to Matthew chapter 11, we encounter John the Baptist in a state of disappointment. Expectations that he had of his cousin Jesus to be the Messiah are not what he assumed them to be. John has certain beliefs of who the Messiah was and what the Messiah was to do. And in today's reading, we see John in a prison cell pacing the floors of the prison, unable to see the light of day. And the prison of those, those days was not a destination to go to, it was just a waiting place, because they didn't keep you in prison long, if you were found guilty, they'd just kill you and get you out of the way. So it was only a place of waiting, like the waiting that we are occurring in this Advent season as we wait the return of our King and of our Savior. And he was in prison because he decided to speak truth to power, much the same way that Jesus will speak truth to power before he heads to the cross when he's before Pilate himself, Pontius Pilate, that is, the governor of Judea at the time. His behavior, John the Baptist's behavior, was risky. But it was never as risky as when he decided to speak that truth to the powers that be in his day and it got him in prison, jailed. And we read this account with this John that had such high expectations of what the Messiah was to be and now is disappointed and discouraged. And we read these words. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, go back. And report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to you. Isn't that enough, John? Read between the lines here. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. In other words, these people that received that healing touch from Jesus, they are blessed people. They understood what Jesus' ministry was about. But as John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John, his cousin, John the Baptist. What did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, that among those born of women, there hasn't risen anyone greater than John. John greater than Abraham? John greater than Jacob? John greater than Isaac? John greater than Isaiah? John greater than Ezekiel? John greater than Jeremiah? John is greater than all those great men of faith and Noah? And then Jesus says, yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than me. So if we except Jesus, and we find the joy that is in Jesus. Is Jesus saying that we are even greater than John and all those great names that I mentioned beforehand? See how Jesus is raising our stature and our dignity and lifting up our heads to face the truth of what true salvation and freedom is in him and the joy that it brings to us. See, people, this is the word of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. See, today in our scripture, in Matthew 11, we see quite a change in John the Baptist that Pastor Vinny was speaking about last week. Last week, he was busy bellowing out invitations to repent 
and challenging the religious authorities of his days with vigor. But this week he seems different. It seems like prison time does something to the human spirit. This week he doesn't appear to be so quite so sure about himself, or quite so sure of the one for whom he was preparing the way. Since John was thrown into prison, Jesus has gone public. His ministry started after John was in prison. And he's preaching a message that John himself, the Baptist, preached. Almost word for word, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. As Albert Hong writes, who wrote that Lord of King devotion, he says, repentance, and Pastor Betty brought this up last week, and just to recap, repentance is not about remorse, regrets, I'm sorry. Repentance is about change. Hello? Repentance is about change. We believe that we enter the second birth that Charles Wesley wrote about in the Christmas carol, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Jesus not to make, does not intend to make us better people. You go to Tony Robbins for those kind of things. If you want to become a better person, to listen to motivational speakers. But Jesus came to change us, to transform us, to turn us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, from the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of light, from the people of no mercy to the people of mercy. Jesus came to change us. And what is so good about repentance? And how did that ever tie with peace? Because you only get peace through repentance. Repentance is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Act John's in prison. And his emotional state is in turmoil. And so is his belief system. Hello? Can you imagine what John must have been mulling over and over again in his mind, his soul, and his heart about his cousin Jesus? In Jesus' role as the Messiah, you know, we make a lot of decisions in the outcome of the day. The experts tell us that we make 35,000 conscious decisions every day. 35,000. Don't stop and count them up because you go crazy. But you make 35,000. That means just in the time of, of Advent, as we prepare our hearts to encounter God and walk in intimacy with God and, and ask God to continue to purify our hearts and, and cause us to be the children that He wants us to be. We will make 850,000 decisions. No wonder Jesus says, don't worry about tomorrow. Because you can't handle it. And John is following all these decisions and all these things that he heard about how, what the Messiah was and who the Messiah was to be and what he is supposed to be doing. And he's saying, hey, cousin, are you the one? Are you the one? How many times have we said that with a pastor? And as they come to take the church and say, well, he's the one, and then after the fifth or sixth year, is he really the one that should be here with us? Hello? Hello? Is Jesus who he says he is? See, the disciples of John, they make a prison visit. They have a prison ministry. They inquire about his cousin. And John sends them off with that question, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? John the Baptist was disappointed to the point of being offended by Jesus' ministry because he didn't live up to John's expectations. Hello? Just like people that come and go don't live up to our expectations. The daughter-in-law, the son-in-law, don't live up to what we expected our children to bear. Hello? And John said, why is Herod the Apostle still on the throne? Why is the Romans still governing over Judah? Why hasn't the revolution started, my cousin? And the test begs us all to ask the following question during Lent. Are you disappointed with Jesus today? Are you disappointed with Jesus today? Well, don't give me the cliche answers. When God knows the trouble of your heart, and knows the struggle that you go through, and the questions that you ask, and as a church, are we disappointed with Jesus? Disappointed because the wayward child that we've been praying for for years hasn't come to Christ, or the uncaring boss hasn't paid attention to me, or the uncaring spouse hasn't paid attention to me. 
The job you prayed for, the dream you had, has never come. And you're disappointed because you thought Jesus was supposed to answer all those questions for you because that's what you thought he should do. And the Spirit hasn't come, the revival hasn't come, and we're waiting and we're praying and nothing is happening. And we go through the motions that the old church did, the old holiness and Pentecostal churches. For 48 weeks of the year, you're like Achan. You know Achan that stole those things that he shouldn't steal in Joshua's day. And, and then they were looking for him and he was one that had stole them and then they killed him afterwards. So we're looking for somebody in the church path who's causing sin for 48 weeks. Because if we find out who's causing sin and we get rid of that sin problem, then revival will come. And then in the old days, they would go into four weeks of revival. And they say, go call all those friends you have in the neighborhood and to join us for this time of special meetings. Well, for 48 weeks, you told the congregation, go hang around with those people. And then you expect your people to go out and tell them to come to a meeting? Is that what we behave? Is that what we think the kingdom of God is all about? Some of you buy lottery tickets. Because you think that that one great win is going to help you pay all your debts. <laughs> And the lottery ticket never wins. You never win, and your debts just keep escalating, escalating, and the burdens just keep on being heaped upon you more and more each day. See, John's got what we call the prison blues. And he's sitting on death row. We know his end in chapter 14. He doesn't make it. But maybe John was not only preparing the way of Jesus of announcing the kingdom of God and repent that is there, but maybe he was also preparing the way of how Jesus would one day get off. When he appeared before the powers that be the structure of his day, both the Roman and the Jewish hierarchy. And John needs some answers, he's not getting them. And what comes to John's mind is probably the sermon that Jesus preached in Nazareth. You know that sermon when he takes the, the scroll from Isaiah 61, he said, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news, to release the captives. We sang about that this morning. To bring the people out of prison. And John said, Hey, cousin, I'm in jail. And what am I doing here? I thought I'm supposed to get out of jail. I thought he was supposed to free me. Why am I in this mess that I'm in? This is John the Baptist who spent his entire adult life pointing to the Messiah, to Jesus of Nazareth, as the fulfillment of all the prophetic hopes that we find. This is the one who said, make ready the way of the Lord. This is the one who said, the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one who said, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. This is the one in whom he said, behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. Now all he sees around him is disappointment and hardship. For the brutes of the world are still ruling over Jerusalem. The sequel's not looking good for John at this point. But, oh, that's what he feels. That's what some of you guys feel after New Year's. Where did, where did the season go? Where did the joy go? Where's the peace? Where's the hope? Where's the love? Where did it go? Where did it go? Yeah, big question. Are you the one? You see no political revolution. A political takeover has started since John has been in prison. The spirit of expectation is so low on the basis of what they hear and see in Jesus' ministry. And John is questioning himself. Is my faith in my cousin as the Messiah a colossal mistake or not? You ever feel that way? Hello? Nobody's honest. Do you think God's going to help us when we're not honest with ourselves, with each other? Are you for real, Jesus? And Jesus came up with an answer. Disciples of John head out, they meet Jesus, and Jesus, and they repeat John's question, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? And then Jesus responds with this message of mercy. Mercy. Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed. If it was a Pentecostal congregation, we'd be screaming up and down now. The deaf hear. The dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Jesus' view of ministry is completely different than John. Jesus believed that his contemporaries, they got it wrong. 
They wanted to fight darkness with darkness, violence with violence, evil with evil. And Jesus didn't come ministering in the way that they expected him to come. Just like Jesus doesn't come ministering in the way that you expect him to come. He comes in the way that he has been chosen by God to come. And he's telling John's disciples that people are going to be offended because I'm a merciful minister. I'm full of compassion and love. I'm not looking to Harold and Caesar. I'm looking to those that are the scum of the earth according to those in the high places. And one day those in the high places will be toppled down because that's what Mary sang about it. My soul rejoice in the Lord my God that the high will be brought low and the low will be brought high. See, John was looking for an ax to cut down the unfruitful trees. But instead, he hears about healing and that mercy. John was looking for political uprisings. Instead, he got mercy. Jesus is healing the broken. He's healing the sick. He's freeing the ones in bondage to demons in the world. Jesus is teaching his people about loving their enemies, turning the other cheek, and putting others before themselves, being meek, being humble, being generous. In chapter 5 and to 7 of the Sermon on the Mount, which we spent months on, and Jesus, indeed, John, is, John and his disciples are looking for judgment and fire. You know how many times we heard recently that people aren't coming to the Lord because we're not talking judgment and fire? That's John's point of view of what Jesus should have been doing. And he didn't do it. He didn't do it. Jesus didn't do it. Why? Because his ministry was one of reconciliation. To bring two people that are at odds with each other, that are fighting with each other, so that they become one in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus is telling John's disciples to read Isaiah again. You missed the prophets. You got it all wrong. The Messiah is not coming to take over the Roman Empire. He's coming to take over the world that has kept you in bondage the power of sin and death and to release you and to put joy in your spirit so that even though you are suffering, even though the world is stepping upon you and treading upon you, you are free in your spirit to worship the living God. That's what gives us joy, unspeakable and full of glory. The kingdom of God is not about political gain. It's not the role of the Christian church to take over Ottawa. It's not the role of the Christian church to take over Washington. It's not the role of the Christian church to take over Rome or London or Paris or any capital in North Korea, in China, in India, in the rest of the world. The church role is to lift up the name of Jesus Christ with joy and praise and honor and glory and exalt his name. This is what the Messiah came to do. Even in our day, Jesus' disciples are struggling with these same issues when reading the headlines of our media. We're looking for an axe to Political. Financial Jesus. We're not looking for a merciful Jesus. Are you looking for a merciful Jesus? Not everyone's going to accept Jesus' words, but he said, blessed are the ones who do not stumble on account of him. Are you one? Are you one? See, like John and Jesus, followers of Jesus across the earth do not agree on what we mean by the kingdom of heaven. Some just believe it's a spiritual world. Some believe it's a social, compassionate ministry world. And, it, and it's both and. It's never either or. But they like to fight at each other because they say it's only this way. The other one said it's only this way. No, you got it wrong. Read the scriptures. What we all agree is that the kingdom of heaven is not what we see in our world today. We don't see peace. We don't see more justice. We don't see truth. We don't see celebration. We don't see joy. We don't see transformation. And we all long for that in whatever side of the divide that we sit on. And like the people of Jesus' day and John's day, we are weighed down by our own human expectation of the what, the how, and the to whom of what the kingdom of God is all about. See, John expected an Elijah to come, even though he was the Elijah. That the fire may come from heaven and burn those gods, <coughs> gods of Baal one more time. And Jesus is thinking, I'm the one that Isaiah prophesied. The one that's going to make the blind see, the one that's going to make the lame 
jump and walk and leap for joy, the one that's going to cure the leper of the disease, the one that's going to make the deaf hear, the dead be raised, and the good news preached to the poor. That's the one that I am. Did you notice that Jesus doesn't answer our questions? Neither in this text. There's no yes from this person. There's no no that I'm not that person. Basically he says, go and tell John what you hear, what you see. What you hear and what you see. What do you see going on? You see the acts of mercy? In my kingdom, you see acts of mercy in my church, do you see extensions of love and compassion amongst the people? Or do you see a spirit that feeds the visions? And we got it right and they got it wrong. What do you see? What do you hear? And underneath it all is the question is Jesus enough for you? Is he enough for you this Advent season? And you can say, all right, there's still blind people, lame people, new people in Israel. There's still people that are sick and suffering in our world. But how many miracles do you need to see to keep on believing that Jesus is who he said he is? King Herod was still making coins with his picture and spending huge budgets on his fancy building projects. Pilate was still robbing the temple treasury, the money that belonged to God, to fix the plumbing system in Jerusalem. Herod was a well knowledgeable architect and built many great buildings. So it's a study in itself to, uh, to understand this man and what he did during that time. Then Herod has some cronies who were very much experts in breaking people's knee kneecaps, rather, if they didn't do what he wanted them to do. Then you're part of that crowd of John the Baptist the like, where's the axe, Lord? Where's the fire, Lord? Why are the rich always prospering, Lord? Why are evil people in political positions, Lord? Why, why, why? Are you disappointed in this Christmas season? See, the picture Matthew pays for us is that to be the coming one is going to disappoint a lot of people. And we in the church think that we should please everyone. No. If you're following Jesus, you're going to disappoint some people. Because they've got their own warped image of who Jesus is and what the kingdom of God is all about. Everyone in power of Israel, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, the Zealots, the Pharaohs, they all had their picture of what the Messiah was, and they all got it wrong. Jesus never answered their question because he always gives us the right. He's a gentleman. He's a king. He's my majestic one. He gives you the right to make your own decisions. Based on what you see and what you hear. It's a wonder we see that during Christmas, or not? Do you see what I see? Do you hear what I hear? What oh, Christ, what do you see going on in your life and in the life of the church? I love this statement. The kingdom of God is not imposed on it's offered to you. God doesn't impose anything upon us. He offers you the good news. Your role is to accept it or reject it. Remember I said a few weeks ago or months ago that God's love is uncontrolling? He loves you, but he's not going to twist you up and make you do what he wants you to do. You have to freely accept it and freely live it out. But the church has been guilty of controlling for a long time and it hasn't stopped. And we need to repent of that and fall underneath the authority and the sovereignty of Jesus Christ as Lord and King to move more, to move more forward in our lives. It's sad that this current political crisis in the United States has an effect around the world of how people view the church. And some of us has fallen into the trap and think that's what we are to be and do. Michael Byrd is a New Testament scholar from Australia. He was visiting the States to promote one of his books. And he sat down and he watched all these crazy news channels. And CNN reports this way and Fox reports that way. And they all got their pictures and their paintings of who Jesus is and what Jesus represents. And he stands back and he calls it foolishness and he begins to write an article. And he sends it to Washington Post and guess what? They publish it. They publish it. 
Here's a long quote from what he said to them. I think it needs to wake us up to what do you see, what do you hear of the Jesus that you serve? This is what he writes. I simply do not recognize the plethora of American Jesus. On a sidebar, there's a movie coming out starring Richard Gere as a psychiatrist about three patients in a, in a asylum, asylum that think they are really Jesus. I read about that story ages ago, but now they have put it to film. Moving on. A plethora of American Jesuses who spawned by the political left and the political right. What I see is neither the Jesus of Nazareth that I know from history, nor the Christ of faith that I know from my church. To begin with, I am not remotely convinced by the Jesus of American conservative culture. A Jesus who sounds like a vivified version of Ronald Reagan. Then among progressives, their Jesus is often described in the ways that will probably best fit the long-loved love child of Lenin, the communist leader, and Lady Gaga, who grew up to begin to become an Antifa activist. You know what I'm talking about? You watch the news? You are familiar with all these terms? The industry of progressive politics trains in a circular Jesus sanitizes anything that sounds too religious. I understand that everyone wants Jesus on their political side, the right one on their side, the left one on their side, the right, the left. And I understand that, but he says, in fact, I find it heartening that Jesus is still the endorsement that everybody wants. The left wants Jesus, the right wants Jesus, the center wants Jesus. That's a good thing. They all want Jesus. But then he says, I'm vexed as to how somebody could possibly claim that Jesus was white, that Jesus believed in tough immigration policy, that Jesus supported user-paying health care, or that Jesus had a gun he would defend himself against the Romans. I have a difficulty believing that. But he says, I'm also puzzled by the left to hear that Jesus was a first century brown-skinned Aramaic-speaking Jew who believed in same-sex marriage and decriminalizing marijuana or cannabis or legalizing it in our context. What we see here is the image of Jesus being constantly twisted and contorted into a bearable fashion by human minds and not by the word of the living God. Jesus is recreated in two images. Either he's Caesar, the conservatives, or he's Shea Camaro for the progressives. But that's not who Jesus is. The Word was in the beginning, and the beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word is the same Word that spoke at the beginning of the Genesis story that created the heavens and the earth together. That Word is the true God who created all things that became a human like me and you and lived that life out in its fullness. That he is made in the image of God, but he made you in the image of God, not in the image of Caesar or in the image of Shaker Barrow or some revolutionary type that existed in history. He's made Jesus, not that he can change the mind of God, but that you can be changed and receive joy and peace and love and hope. Jesus didn't come to change the mind of God. It was God's plan to send his son. Stop believing that foolishness, because he loves you so much. Do you have it in your bulletin? What do you see? What do you hear? Remember, read Isaiah for Christmas. They have eyes, but they don't see. They have ears, but they don't hear. They have hearts, but they don't respond. If they would only turn to Jesus, they will be healed. The first end of Isaiah chapter 6 makes that clear. My dear friends in church, we live in, in a time of conflict, right? We live in a time in our culture where everybody is at odds in itself. And it's in the church. Let's speak the truth. It's in the church. We see it. We hear it. By the comments people make, by the reaction people take, by the gestures that people have, we see it in the church too. How have we failed to live up to be a people of mercy? A people that believe in reconciliation, a people that believe in renewal, a people that believe in revival. How did we get on this path that leads to division and division and division and division instead of unity and harmony and healing? How? By having the wrong image of Jesus, my friends. By having the wrong image of Jesus. By robbing Jesus of what I think he should look like instead of let Jesus draw himself in here. That he can take care of himself. I believe in that. Well, we 
What John didn't realize, and what many today don't realize, is the following. That Jesus comes to fulfill God's plan, not God's plan. You know, I've talked a lot about the response after the response. One of the examples of the people that get emotional during the service or get caught up in the service and say, wow, that was a great service, wasn't it, Pastor? Is Saul. Remember King Saul? He wasn't a good example, right? But when he was around the prophets, Saul prophesied like the rest of the prophets. But after he left that gathering of prophets, he forgot all about the God who spoke through him to the people. That's what we do. In and out, we're having a good time. But when we go out those doors, it's the same spirit still moving in our hearts to make a difference in our world. See, John's people wanted to hear, where's the wrath of God? And Jesus says, I play the musical verse. Don't you like this tune? Don't you like this melody? Oh yeah, judgment's coming one day, but judgment's been delayed. Hello? It's a time of mercy. It's a time to get some joy in your step. It's a time to let your eyes see through Christ's eyes. It's a time to let your ears hear through the Spirit's ears. Let him who hears the Spirit listen. Hearts to respond. John wants nothing but access, willing place, and burning shaft. You know what gets John going even worse? That the people that are supposed to be suffering under the judgment and fire that he that he, he longing to see are the ones that Jesus is drinking with and fellowshipping with. The ones who are to be burned up like shaft. Jesus keeping company with them. All year round, every day, he's not waiting for those four weeks of revival to call him in. Every year, every day of the year, he's out there saying, Hey, you need Jesus, you need mercy. Are you sick here? I'll pray for you. Are you in need here? We're going to get a hamper together. We're going to give it to you. Do something good, my friends. And be merciful like he is merciful. Are you the coming one, or should we wait for someone to pass? And he right says these words, as, just as wicked people don't like the message of judgment because they think that it's aimed at them, rightly it is aimed at them. So sometimes good people, good church people, don't like the message of mercy because they think wrongly that people are going to get away with wickedness. They're never get away with it. But if it's time to announce mercy and grace, why don't we do it more often instead of signing the judgment and fire and access? And cutting each other in your support system. Mercy is what God wants us to see. You see, when we see who Jesus is, we see what the world is. You know what the world is? He said it. The world's blind. The world's unclean. The world's lame. The world is deaf. The world is mute. And the world is in need of mercy and redemption. Who would go out this advent and share that good news? To the poor. To the wayward. See, God is doing what he does best, applying mercy to those that are in need. And one day in your lifetime, you will part and become merciful. And then that one day that you encounter the living Jesus Christ, you became a people of mercy. Don't forget that. Don't forget that. Let's stop the feeding of the visions because of our petty artistic, verbal, or paintbrush images of the Christ that we draw. I don't care if you're left or right. I only care if you follow the true king in the way that he wants us to follow. I think this is good news. But the question that affects us all, what do you love? Lord, I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for the joy that you have given to us. I thank you, O oh Lord, that the words to John that you even address people in our age, that even if John was greater than all those great people before him, you call us great as well. I thank you, O oh Lord, that you have positive influence in our life. And you want us to have positive influence in our families, in our communities, in our world. You want us to have confidence together 
a word taken from two Latin meanings, having faith together. No one is the lone ranger. Lord, I pray that we would hear your voice. I pray that we will see your work in our life amongst the least of them. I pray, O oh Lord, that you would help us see the people in our community that are in need and minister to them. I pray that you would forgive us for making judgment on who receives what and who gets what and who should have the place of authority because no one has the place of authority but you, Jesus. You rule over us. I pray that you would speak to your people beyond today. Help us, Lord, to move from a life of centering around ourselves to a life that is centered around you. For the glory of your name, for the furtherance of your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Come. As we stand and sing this song, is he worthy? Is he worthy? Is he worthy? See, John questioned that day that he was in prison. He was beginning to wonder if Jesus was worthy at all because of what he's seen. What you see in your own life, you think that, well, this shouldn't be happening. But it's, it is happening. And I'm kind of disappointed that Jesus is that decision. I need my part to be made right with God. As we sing this song, I invite you to put us all to a prayer. I already showed you my ultimate concern is not the response, but the response after the response. So let's sing to the Lord.
this morning time together. We thank you, Lord, that you are a God of mercy. That you've come, O oh Lord, from the West Society, even John the Baptist, he is unclean. The blind, the lame, the deaf, the mute, the ones in prison, the lepers. And yet he showed compassion and loving kindness. I know one thing, O oh Lord, that those people that were healed by your hand experienced your joy. And the ones that were only looking for wrath and access and fire were depressed and negative and lacked the joy of the Lord. Did you hear our cry for true joy this Advent season? That we will experience the fullness of who you are. That we will not look for images of Jesus made by our world or by, or by theologians or scholars or lay people, but we look to the image that is presented to us in your holy word, the God of all people, who shows mercy to all people, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile, and you call on us that have experienced it greater than the prophets of all. Oh, what a blessing, what a privilege, Lord. We thank you for this deep truth. May we choose to be a people of joy, Lord, instead of bitterness, frustration, and constantly being angry. Now, go with the good news for the poor. Prepare the way for the Lord's return. <coughs> Wait patiently, even though you got a lot of decisions to make. Do not grumble against one another, but encourage one another. Be strong and do not fear. And may God come quickly to save you, rescue you, deliver you, set you free. May Christ Jesus give you everlasting joy and gladness. And may the Holy Spirit strengthen your hearts and lead you on God's way. And do not forget, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Now go in the name of Christ, who is our peace. In the name of Christ, who is our hope, in the name of Christ, who is our joy, in the name of Christ, who is our love, and serve the Lord with gladness. Go now into this world in need of mercy and proclaim that the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> 